Wonderful viewers, wonderful people, uh, lovers of aviation history, uh, welcome to our next video and uh, day three of uh, Dancing with the Arrow Daredevils. We are going to take just one personality between 1904 and 1914 and do a little bit of, you know, how to say, surgery, dissection into why we call him an Arrow Daredevil. Okay, today we're going to look at Glenn Curtis, who you just saw on your screen. Glenn Curtis, and we're going to find out why he, he, he is categorized as a daredevil or an arrow daredevil. Remember from our uh, sneak peek video, I told you that the arrow daredevils are people who, in their feet, or did not have any hindsight, no foresight. And obviously, you will not come up with insight if you don't have hindsight and foresight. These guys never did it. Their main aim, the objective was my device should surpass the device of the Wright brothers in terms of speed, altitude, and time. Full stop. Whether they were going to fly aircraft which could scale over tree tops or rooftops, at that point in time, they had none of it. They didn't even know what we call turbulence, something called clear air turbulence, which could just be tossing the aircraft up and down. At that time, they never thought of things like that because they had no meteorological information, no information about the technical status of the aircraft for the day, nothing. All they had to do was hop onto an aircraft after they've done their designs and, you know, hop onto an aircraft and uh, off they go. So, before we get into the objectives of the lesson, the real contents of Glenn Curtis, like we always say, don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And uh, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell another friend that Captain Amwa is here again with another panga. So, the objectives of today's lesson, that is day three of Dancing with the Arrow Daredevils, where we the focus on the spotlight or the zoom is on Glenn Curtis. We objectives are to recast your mind to 17th December 1903, because everything happened 17th December 1903. And we're also going to look at the last to compete with the Wright Brothers in terms of speed, altitude, and um, distance, okay? And maybe time, are you okay? This was all the objectives of the Aero Daredevils, and that was it. And why do we call Glenn Curtis an Aero Daredevil? We'll do a brief um, talk on his bio and the event that made him an Aero Daredevil, and we'll see how it is linked to the joy we are experiencing in aviation today. Today you guys go and fly, or we all go and fly, and it's so seamless. The experience, the sweet experience is just so seamless. But uh, we always have to cast our mind back to 17 December 1903. And like we, I said in the previous videos, 17 December 1903 is when the Wright brothers changed the concept of flying to self-motorized. That's from air-assisted before 17 December 1903 to self-motorized flights. Are you okay? And from that time onwards, other people got on board in 1904. Other people got on board and said, look, we're going to do something to challenge the guys. So aviation industry experts or aviation historians believe that the 17 December 1903 was what set the scene for the aviation world we have today, 108, 17 years down the road. And you look at previous pictures of the first aircraft, Flyer 1. Interesting to know that the first aircraft, there's a self-motorized concept of the Wright brothers. The first test or their first experiment lasted only 12 seconds airborne. The aircraft was able to stay afloat for only 12 seconds. Today, this Airbus that you see here, depending on weights and uh, fuel and other considerations, can comfortably do 15 hours. And I said it again, not 15 seconds, not 15 minutes, 15 hours non-stop, comfortably. And sometimes if you even reduce the weight, it can even do further, non-stop. 
all because of what the Wright brothers did on 17 December 1903. Improvements came, dead devils came onto the scene, and other things just kind of evolved. And today, what do we see? We enjoy everything. Like I said in previous videos, again, the first pilot, or that's the Wright brothers themselves, didn't have a seat in their aircraft to even sit down comfortably, buckle the seat belt in all uh, you know angles, and you know adjust the seat back and forth. They never had none of. They didn't even have a seat to start with. They were lying down and flying their device in an open top, you know, uh, if I say cockpit. It was not as sophisticated as today. But it's what they did that first of all invited the Aero Daredevils onto the scene. And one of them is Glenn Curtis. So always appreciate that everything we see today dates back to 17 December 1903. That's about 117 years back. Okay? So that's the appreciation for you to always appreciate the Wright brothers. Because had the Wright brothers not, had they not done what they did, I you okay? We wouldn't have had Aero Daredevils in the first place. So we we'll look at the bios of Glenn Curtis. A very short bio, Glenn Curtis. And we'll um, try to understand the events because after I go through the Bible, I know you're going to say, and so what? What's so special about it? That's where we come in to tell you what's special about him. All right. So Glenn Curtis was born uh, in 1878 and uh, passed off 1930. Initially, he was a uh, manufacturing bicycles like uh, the Wright brothers. He was into bicycle manufacturing. Remember, in those days, the mode of transport was bicycles before motors. Cars were kind of for the luxurious and the, the rich and famous and everything. So bicycle business was kind of a booming thing, like how today car business is booming. Are you okay? It's a booming business. So they were, most of these guys were into bicycle business. So Glenn Curtis initial profession was that he was a bicycle businessman, if I should say, building. And his own was, his specialty was racing bicycles. That's bicycles for racing, you know. And that was his speciality, Glenn Curtis' initial profession. Question, how did he get into the aviation industry? He got into it because if you know your history, uh, your science history, one of the inventors of the telephone that we've used today that has also evolved into a cell phone and everything, one of the telephones was invented by Alex Graham Bell. Graham Bell invited Glenn Curtis, so we assume that they were friends, and Graham Bell invited Glenn Curtis to what we call an, an, an aerial experimental meeting. You remember, the daredevils were not only people who were uh, inventing aircrafts. We had some daredevils who were kind of experimenting things and feeding the inventors with information needed to, you know, invent their aircraft. So this is our association was Aerial Experimental Association. He just invited Glenn Curtis to a meeting and Glenn Curtis, uh, if I say, struck a chord with the aviation industry and said, I want to be in this industry. So Glenn Curtis also in, uh, invented an, uh, something we call an aileron. Those of you who are very interested in aerodynamics, uh, you realize that it's actually the device that enables an aircraft turn left and turn right. It's called the aileron system. I'll, I'll explain it in other videos when we are doing aerodynamics and other videos. Basically, a more assisted way to turn the aircraft left and right or to bank the aircraft left and right smoothly using what we call the aileron. So we apply the ailerons in the cockpit and the result is that the aircraft banks left or right. Before then, the Wright brothers had what we call the wing flapping system that was used in controlling the aircraft and Glenn Curtis invented the aileron. So that's the first thing he did after joining this aerial experimental association meetings. I mean, he just fell in love with aviation. Like I told you, most of these aero daredevils were engineers. Some of them were bicycle and car racing uh, guys. You know, most of them were rich and famous who just decided to use flying as a hobby. Those were the kind of likes of aviators between, you know, all the way up even up to the First World War. Okay, so Glenn Curtis in 1907, when he was invited to this aerial experimental regime, that's what gave him the first love, or if I say he struck a chord with the aviation industry. And he decided to invent what we call the ailerons, which assisted in banking the aircraft left and right. So when we use ailerons today, uh, well, what we have to understand is that it all dates back to 1907 when Graham Bell invited him to that meeting. What is so special? A year after, he flew an aircraft in a public display uh, during 1908 when America was celebrating an Independence Day. So, 4th July, we can say 4th July 1908. He flew this aircraft and did this air display to the amazement and cheers of, of the crowd in those days, remember. And after that, he continued in this aviation industry by inventing what you call seaplanes. In those days, 
seaplanes were becoming more common after the Wright brothers did what they did. Seaplanes. The whole idea is that okay, we can be on the sea, get airborne, and when we come back, we land back on the sea. So it was called flying boats. He was one of the first. He's also known as the pioneer of flying boats. And also in 1914, he became a leading aircraft manufacturer, and he's one of the guys who contributed to manufacturing aircrafts uh, for the First World War. Now, question. What is so special about flying over an independence ground? Today, 117 years down the road, it is just like second nature. Any government has an event, obviously Air Force guys fly in formation. I mean, seamless, you know, formation to the amazement of the crowd. Today is kind of natural, it's second nature. Are you okay? But remember, in his time, nobody had done it before him. The risks were so much, I don't even think he ever thought of it. If there was a problem with the flight controls, I don't know. Those guys standing outside there, I don't know for them. For us, as, as we say in our Ghanaian balance. But today, when you see Air Force guys doing it, it's all because of 117 years of hindsight, foresight, that they have insight on how to fly formation. So you go to the Air Force, I mean the trainings that you have to do even what you call the simulator that they had to even I mean, practice those things first before doing it on the real day itself all dates back to uh, 4th July 1908 okay Glenn Curtis could have made a, a terrible mistake either, either on his part in terms of controlling the aircraft could have had technical issues and in those days like I told you not like today where you have what you call quick, quick reference handbooks to deal with emergencies for every aircraft we didn't have none of these things. Weather reports. We, we, we couldn't care. If it's just a clear day, we just take our aircraft and go and fly. We didn't know what the clouds were going to do, the height of the cloud base, all these things, nothing. No, no, none of those things existed in those days. So during this air display, of course, it was so charming. The audience were happy because remember, Wright Brothers did what they did just five years before then. Still, people had still not seen so much of these devices flying around. So to be on a, if it's at a certain venue during Independence Day, obviously those days it was more of outdoor events. And seeing these aircraft fly over you with all the displays and aerobatics, I'm of, of course, I can imagine how exciting, how breathtaking it was. But it was at a very, very great risk of the lives of Glenn Curtis. You know, anything could have gone wrong. That's why I'm talking about the risk factor. Anything could have gone wrong, either with himself, with the aircraft, or even the weather. You could have just had some clouds just uh, zooming in that place, and he wouldn't see anything. The next thing you see, maybe he would just run into a building or a tree. Why? Because he didn't have meteorological information before going. Remember the last video? A civilized airline setup. Pilot goes to work. He has all the information he needs for a flight. Weather-wise, aircraft technical-wise, what's happening at an airport, where he's going, Everything he has all the insights before he takes the decision to either go delay or cancel their flight. In those days, they had nothing. So on the 4th of July, you can see the day is so clear out there, but you could have clouds because nobody knew the forecast and how it applies to aviation. So you could just have some clouds just zooming in and just um, you know obscuring his view. And the next thing you see, uh, you know, uh, the next thing you see, disaster. Are you okay? So this is why. Glenn Curtis is an aero daredevil because today when you see Air Force displays so seamless, you have to understand that it all dated back to 4th July 1908. So today Air Force guys have so much training, that's what we call insights. Because of foresight and hindsight, they have insights. Every aircraft has a manual, a manual to do everything, a manual to deal with emergencies and manual to do everything and you can even simulate this in a device before you come i mean onto the aircraft on the real day you would have simulated enough of it you know we have weather information we even know the forecast sometimes three months ahead of time we know the forecast of the airport in three we can do that if we want to and you can to be so precise it's not magic we have so much tools, so much infrastructure to do all these things. So that's why he's an elder. Sadly, as and when he was improving in his aircraft manufacturing and all the things that he was doing, uh, the Wright brothers got into a lawsuit with him because um, he is not so clear what caused the suit, but it appears from history that he was also trying to tell the Wright brothers that your previous technology of controlling the aircraft, that's warping wings and everything, 
he, Glenn Curtis, was the one who even initiated it. And I better said no. And he said yes, no, yes, no. It ended up in court. A long battle over patent. Who did it? And he himself decided to kind of, uh, the interest, uh, you know, departed from him and not, uh, not long ago, not long after he passed on. So this is Glenn Curtis for you. And like we said, let us review why we call him an arrow daredevil. Because on that day, the public display on 4th July 1908, okay, he had no hindsight. He had no, nobody had done this before him. And nobody had made some mistakes for him to say, okay, I'm learning from this. So obviously, if you don't have hindsight, you will not have foresight. As in, this can happen, that can happen, weather can change, aircraft can go, something on the aircraft can go wrong, you know, things like that. So how high must I fly over the event? He had none of this. And obviously, if you don't have hindsight and you don't have foresight, you don't have insight. Insight means that you don't have aircraft manuals, you don't have checklists, you don't have procedures, you don't have simulation devices. All these things that you see today, that makes um, Air Force display so precise and, you know, seamless and everything. He never had it. Okay, and he also in manufacturing all these aircrafts and everything and testing, he still did not have hindsight, foresight, and insight. So if he tests it and one day the control jams, for example, and he's not able to pitch up or pitch down, now everything is now left to chance. It could have happened in all the aircrafts that he manufactured even before the First World War. So, ladies and gentlemen, I bring you Glenn Curtis. It's been fun uh, trying to know him. And uh, from the studios of Aviation Maestro Multimedia, all we say is, Please stick with us on the next videos. They are exciting people who came to do exciting things.